Hello friends, happy Medical Billers Network live Thursday. I uh, realize I'm a little too high in my seat. There we go, <laughs> that'll fix that. How is everyone out there today? Let me know that you're in the house if you are just joining me today. My name is Jasmine Vealiz. If it's your very first time in this space, you are in the place where we eliminate the stress and confusion in the business of healthcare. On this particular platform with Medical Billers Network Live, we do that through revenue cycle optimization improvement discussions. Today, we are talking rejections and denials, and we're going to look, um, we're going to talk through just general topics around what they are, cover again strategies around working them, and then we're going to look at some examples in um, open practice solutions. So uh, if you are just getting in here, let me know in the comments that you are here. And today's question of the day, are you familiar with open practice? Do you know open practice? That's a really great question. I didn't know today's question of the day. I didn't look. <laughs> I was like, wait, but, um, today's question of the day is open practice solution. I guess if you've been hanging out with me for a little while, you might be a little familiar with open practice. My cat is my cat is very having a lot of fun today. I guess <laughs> I know when she so if you see her just jetting back and forth, it's because she's really excited that I'm home. I've been gone most of the morning. Um so uh she's a little little hyper. So Lisa's here. Hi Lisa. Thanks so much for joining today. I hope you're having a great day. Do you know anything about open practice? I'm curious if you've been if you've gotten a glimpse into the software before. And uh Today, we have a, while you guys get in here, go ahead and, and um, pop a comment in while you're getting yourself situated. I'm going to go ahead and, hi, Tiana. I'm going to go ahead. Great to see you. Camille's in the house. Hey, what's up? Great to see you. I love it when I get to see OG names. I haven't 
seen you guys consistently in a while. So yay. And welcome back to actually making the live stream during the live stream. I know that that's a struggle during the day for most of us. So we're going to pop, quickly pop up the screen share here. And oops, I forgot to rewind it while I was <laughs> looking at it earlier. Okay. So today we are talking denials and rejections in open practice. We are going to look at this in another software. Uh, I think you guys may, if you've been hanging out, you may recall when Sam came on and we briefly covered or chatted about Alpha and we're going to be looking at that software next um, and that will probably be either next week or the following week. We're trying to just sort out schedules here, um, but we are going to look at open practice today and I'd love to find out what questions you guys have about strategies to work your accounts, your, your, not your accounts, your, rules, your denials and rejections um, as we walk through that. So if there's something that you're struggling with or perhaps something um, that you're just exploring for the first time. I want to know where you are. And uh, last week, we did five tips to reduce claim rejection. So we walked through um, some, some really important best practices regarding um, claim rejections. We also, the week before, discussed types of rejections and really discussed the differences and understanding the importance of those. We're going to do a little review of that at the first part of our time together today just to make sure that everyone's on the same page before we get into uh, working rejections and kind of a little bit more nitty gritty in from, a, from the lens of a software. So, um, hi, Dawood, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining the live. All right, so uh, if you're brand new here, then uh, you may not know that this is in Larry University. We are the place where we eliminate the stress and confusion in the business of healthcare. If it's your very first time with us, please go ahead and consider hitting the thumbs up and get, or the, the wherever you are watching from, there might be a little heart or a thumbs up and consider clicking that subscribe button. If you're watching on YouTube, ring the notification bell so that you get notified when we go live. This is our second time live this week. We were live on Tuesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, and you may not have been aware of that if you are not a member. So members had a special member live this past Tuesday. It was our first member live. It's a Q&A. So if you are someone interested in opportunities to go a little deeper in discussion, to answer questions that you have related to the revenue cycle or outside of the revenue cycle related to the business of healthcare. So anything related to credentialing and practice management and other areas of expertise, either that I know the answers to or that I can source for you by bringing other guests on the channel or just doing some research for you. So feel free to get to to get information about the memberships. Nicole just popped that into the um, the chat box. So you should see that in all of the channels that you're watching from. And uh, you can get all the information you need. There are two levels of membership. The second level of membership is the member live. And we are going live every month at the moment for our lot for our members. And there's other resources and things that you members are going to get. So um, other freebies and things that we um, are have have either talked about or haven't discussed as of yet, but we're going to be getting a lot of conversation around like specific resources or templates that you really could tap into. And so it's helpful for our folks who are brand new and don't really know where to start or how to build a resource, how to build something to be able like a spreadsheet or any kind of other document that might help you along the way. Um, my favorite thing about the member lives and the opportunities is I get to build a really closer relation, a much closer relationship with you all. And so it's, it's more kind of, uh, we'll say, a, a casual environment, right? So it's one that I would like to have more of a two-way conversation with you guys. So being able to really share in our expertise and us being able to me answer questions for you, but you also being able to just right in those moments, ask those questions or clarifying pieces back. And we can just have a kind of a two-way dialogue for the whole time together. So there there's, um, opportunities for teaching, like I did some screen share and things on this past Tuesday, but it's not going to um, not going to be like one one central topic for the entire time. It'll you guys would be the ones curating the experience. So if you're a member and you did not get your questions submitted, you can always just pop the questions on any of the videos and just say I'm a member, I have a member question or put it into the medical billers uh, network Facebook group, or you can pop it onto that community reminder that will come up on our page as we're leading up to the live stream. You can you can also always email questions to learn at inlara.com at any point, and we will add it to our list so we make sure we get to those in our next member live. All right. So if you'd like to follow us on all the other socials, we are working at being very visible in pretty much every place 
with the exception of X. Um, <laughs> and so feel free to, um, to, to, you know, find us on those places and, um, and just stay tuned for what we're doing in the, in the internet world, in the interweb. If this is your first time being exposed to Enlair, you may not know that we are a fully operational revenue cycle management or medical billing company, however you'd like to um, use the, the term. The, uh, the focus for our company is in revenue cycle management. We do some consulting related to that as well. So if you're a practice in need of services, we do provide those services. In addition to that, we are also an education firm. So we have been building out our entire suite of courses that focus on the business of healthcare, primarily for private practices or for, for uh, medical practices. So not so much on the hospital side, if that's your, your sweet spot at the moment, but you know, who knows what, what the future holds for us. So um, if you have not been exposed to Enlara's courses just yet, here's a couple of examples of, of our courses. So we have what are called uh, instructor-led courses and self-paced courses. So our instructor-led programs are ones where you move at the pace of the instructor, you are more directly connected to the instructor for the course. So mastering medical billing is an example of that. I am the teacher for mastering medical billing. And so you will be with me on live streams at least once a week and sometimes twice a week for labs and other discussions. Um, and then for medical billing 101, if you're someone who's branded to healthcare, that's a really great starter course just to kind of decide. It's like a tip, dip your toes in the water to see if it's what you want to do with your life. <laughs> uh, medical billing 101 is, is a great foundational revenue cycle management course. And at the end of that, you'll kind of be told, okay, here's what a biller does. Are you interested in that? Or maybe you're interested in other things. And here are the other avenues that you might want to explore if medical billing you think is not for you. It also is helpful for folks who are in, say, adjunct specialties areas in healthcare that maybe you just need to understand a little bit more about what happens in the world of medical billing to help clarify your role or what you are doing um, from a day -to -day on a day-to-day -day basis in healthcare. All right. So here we are. Um, let's see. All right. Okay. So grab your pen and paper. If it's your first time hanging out with me, you may have uh, not been aware that I kind of talk a little fast. So you want to make sure that you slow me down. If you already are struggling keeping up, you can do that by slowing down the speed of the video. You can also um, rewatch this at any point in time. So it's going to all be stored and saved wherever you're watching it from. You can come back to it. If you're on YouTube, we have playlist galore. Nicole has worked really hard to make sure that things are organized for you on our playlist. So you should find a lot of associated information in a playlist already curated for you. All right. Um, I've got a great question here from Sharice. Oh, hi, Tyra. Great to see you, friend. Thanks for hanging out. Let's see. I've got a question from Sharice. My membership ends on 3.5. So these are set up. They're all managed by YouTube. So it should automatically renew for you. Um, so if you're having any issues, I believe somewhere on the membership page, it should be able to help, but you can always just send us an email and we can try to help. We don't have visibility like to your card information or anything like that. We can't really control it, but we could try to get you an answer if you can't seem to figure out um, how to how to keep it on. So it should auto renew is my short answer to that question. So hi, is it Aika? Hi, Aika. Thank you so much for joining from the Philippines. I know it's uh, late into the evening, so I hope you are having a lovely uh, evening. And uh, are you working right now? I'm curious. I'm curious. Okay. So um, I'm going to stop screen share for just a moment. And I just realized that I didn't pull my notes out, so give me one minute while I do that. Um, but I want to, to talk foundationally about our topic today. So um, just so that you, if you just joined and you are not aware, we are talking about claims denials and rejections today. Um, and I want to make sure foundationally you guys have an understanding of both of those things first before we march down um, working them in any software. So I'm almost there, you guys. I apologize. And I'm underneath the wrong project. Here we go. Okay. All right. So um, let's just talk about what are the differences between claim rejections and claim denials. So when we're talking about claim rejections and claim denials, um, people sometimes like to group things together. One second, I'm just moving this so I can have it in a better place. There we go. People like to sometimes, oh, by the way, if you're not, if you're not accustomed to how I typically run these, you can ask questions anytime throughout. I will keep poking 
poking, I'll keep peeking at the comments throughout the, the time that I am sharing content and, and sharing um, some teaching, but just pop your comment whenever you get an opportunity and I will be looking at those comments to try to grab them throughout. So feel free to ask any questions, clarifying questions or new questions as they come up. All right. So claim rejections and claim denials. A lot of people try to group the two together, um, mostly because they don't understand and they just think, well, these are just things like insurance isn't paying, right? So they're kind of the same thing, but I really want to harp on the fact that they are not the same and real in real and real truth. One does take precedence over the other. One does take priority, should take priority over the other. And we're going to talk about uh, why today we're going to discuss exactly um, the lens that you should apply when you are seeing these claim rejections and claim denials and really trying to understand how you can organize yourself. So that is our main focus for today. When we're looking at the software, we're just gonna get a little peek into the system and how it, how it could be presented to you in the software that you are working in. Keep in keeping in mind that every system is different, you may have um, full functionality. You may have limited functionality. There are what is called role-based systems out there, which means that you may not be able to see anything related to um, rejections if your job is payment posting, for example. Right? You may not be able to see other areas of the revenue cycle if your system is role-based and you only have access to a specific queue of information. Okay. So don't be um, don't be alarmed if you don't see the other areas of the system. If it's a role-based system and how do you know it's role-based, typically those role-based systems will tell you this is your role when you log in to the system. So if you're doing eligibility or verification, you may only be able to see that, but it is very helpful for you to understand what happens after the fact. And if you're someone new to healthcare and you're interested in moving into other areas of the revenue cycle and potentially uh, moving into leadership, you must know all areas of the revenue cycle, okay? So claim rejections and claim denials. So I will make I want to make sure that you guys understand what each are. So let's just talk claim rejections. And I say claim rejections first because claim rejections come first in the revenue cycle. Okay. Revenue cycle is the way that move, the way that money moves through healthcare in the United States of money. Uh, of America, I was going to say of, of money, <laughs> of America. So in the United States healthcare system, the um, the revenue cycle is the engine that keeps the practices and hospital systems open. Okay, it's the way that we we are able to ensure that our visits are comp are compensated or reimbursed or paid by third parties. So that third party could be a health insurance, it could be a worker's compensation, it could be a liability carrier for um, an auto accident, for example. Doesn't matter. However, whomever is paying, that is the person we are, who, whoever is responsible for payment, that is the person that we are trying to ensure covers these services, okay? So when we think about the revenue cycle, the, the, the revenue cycle is cyclical, okay, which means patient visit starts and then there's a, a, um, a cycle and there's a lot of videos that we have that, that talks about this. There is a cycle that kind of re resembles, we'll say like a clock, right? So the first quarter of our clock is our patient visit, claim being created, okay? Once that happens, claims created, we try to submit the claim and get it out the door. When we are attempting to get our claim to the insurance carrier or that third party, we are attempting to send it to them for reimbursement. When we are submitting our claims electronically, which means we are sending them through a clearinghouse or some other kind of electronic means, um, whether it's with built into our software or an, ex an outside clearinghouse, that system is going to hopefully verify our claim for completeness, completeness and accuracy. And then it's going to send or transmit that claim to said insurance carrier. Okay. And so our hope is that our claim is good to go and it makes it out, out, out of our doors, meaning our claims, um, clearinghouse sends the claim out of our doors to the insurance company's clearinghouse. Okay. When that happens, does not happen successfully, we have a claim rejection. Doors close and they say, boop, 
You can't go anywhere. The, something is wrong with this claim. Okay. So very important to understand typically claim rejections. When we see that in the language, sometimes they come across in other terms. They might that your, your clearing house or, um, practice management system or, or billing medical billing, um, processing software might call it claim edits. Um, what other terms, what other terms have you guys seen? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I know I've definitely seen other terms, um, claim edits or claim review I've seen. Um, let me know if there's other ones that you guys have heard related to claim rejections, um, as well. So the clearing house is saying, uh, -uh something's wrong with the claim. It can't go anywhere. We can't send this claim to insurance. So this is why it's so important that we resolve our claim rejections first, because claim rejections are indicative of the claim, not even making it out of your doors. Okay. And I, I include the clearing house, even if it's an outside clearing house, I include the clearing house as your doors because you are, you still own the clearing house. Okay. The clearing house is still yours. It's not making it to the insurance carrier's clearing house or the payer's clearing house yet. Those words are synonymous. All right. When we have gets stuck in our clearing house, we have a problem, not just that the claim needs to be fixed, but now we potentially, if we don't fix it fast enough, could fall into a situation where our claim might have issues with timely filing. Okay. Especially if you're in a state or a region, there's like a 30 day timely filing limitation or even 90 days. And I say 90 days because some practices are quite slow with preparing their claims and closing out encounters so that claims can even be created and build. So if you, your doctors, providers take nine weeks to get the claims created and you try to submit that claim. So we are already two and a half ish weeks. I mean, two and a half ish months from getting that claim to our, um, clearing house. And then it gets to clearing house. And then you're like three to four weeks behind at, uh, reviewing your rejections or resolving your rejections. There is a chance that you're now, if you've got a 90 day timely filing, you're right up against it. So it's a speed thing, right? If your practice has slow, um, claims that are being produced and there's just a massive delay, there is a chance that you're going to have trouble. Okay. So really important that you have a very strong strategy at reviewing your claim rejections. And we'll talk a little bit about what that strategy could look like. Okay. So we have claim rejections. We have claim rejections coming in from our clearing house. Okay. And then we also have claim rejections that typically we call payer rejections. And those are coming in from our payers clearing house. We did a, a discussion around uh, this a bit more in detail, I think two lives ago. So definitely we watched that one. If you are confused about the differences between the claim clear uh, between our clearing house and the payers clearing house, but basically claim has made it to payer, but payers clearing house closes the door on your claim. Okay. So in most cases, when a payers clearing house rejects your claim, they are not processing that claim. They are not accepting that claim for what we call adjudication or processing. Okay. Means that they are saying, ah, eh, we looked at it and eh, something's missing. Something's wrong. We're sending it back to you as a rejection. So many case in so many cases, the vast majority of the time you are going to have a payer reject a claim and not send you any other communication about that claim. So you're getting a payer rejection. Okay. And that's it. You're not going to get an ER in a, most instances, you're not getting an ERA. You're not getting a, um, a notification in the mail or any sort of, um, correspondence to tell you that the claim is not being processed. Okay. So it's super important. Again, you're looking at rejections, whether it's your clearing house or payer clearing house rejections, where we are taking rejections to the top of the list of priority in our claim process. Okay. So we have our rejections resolved. We're good with that. Okay. We're continuing to move down the process. And before I continue, I'm going to take a peek at the, um, at the comments. Okay, great. Um, all right. So, and I see that Nicole popped a, a potential solution to that problem. So if there's an issue uh, with membership, so if, if you're having trouble with memberships, Nicole put a, um, a support help 
ticket thing. <laughs> I don't know what they call this. Okay. So when we have our uh, claims getting accepted, okay, meaning claim was, was accepted by insurance, it continues down our cycle. Okay. Claim goes to insurance. Insurance says, okay, we'll take it in. Looks good. Thanks for that. And then they start the process of adjudication. Okay. When adjudication happens, adjudication just means processing. And for us, it's them looking at the claim for completeness against the patient's benefits. And the two come together and match up with the policy from the insurance company. So we've got patient benefits, we've got it, the, the claim data, and we have the policy according to the contract, meaning your, your providers or practices, organizations contract with said insurance company could also just be global policy, meaning a policy that just impacts all providers that are working with this particular carrier. Okay. So it may not be specific to your practice, but instead a global kind of medical policy. Okay. So when we have those three things evaluated and the insurance company is matching them all up, we call that process adjudication. Okay. When the claim is coming in for adjudication, that claim is potentially kicked out for any number of reasons that we, that relate to benefits that we were just saying patients benefits, whatever they're uh, benefit policy states, meaning their insurance policy state states, the patient's insurance contract with the insurance company, and then whatever your policy, your organization's policy with the insurance company, that could result in a claim denial. And a denial is when any portion of a claim is not paid for a reason determined by the insurance company. So it could be one charge out of four that you're submitting on a claim. It could be one procedure code that is kicked back and said, no, we won't pay for this one code and maybe others are, are reimbursed. Okay. So you have a potential for one code getting denied, or you have a potential for an entire claim to get denied. Okay. When we have these types of claim denials that are coming in, we have to recognize that they also are important because they tell us exactly what is hopefully, hopefully they tell us exactly what is going on. Um, and I say that because there are some carriers that really don't do a great job at communicating the reason for their denials by way of um, the denial reason codes, which we've talked about a few, a few different um, times these last weeks leading up to today's conversation, but our denial reasons are the claim um, denial reason codes are coming on our EOBs, the electron um, ex explanation of benefits or ERAs, the electronic remittance advices. So the, the details about the claim processing are, are either paper EOB or an electronic ERA. Um, both of those documents will have some form of explanation as to why the insurance is not paying something. And so typically we're, if we're getting that in, in ANSI language, which is our standard language for electronic, uh, conversations through, um, through, through communications that come through our, um, through our ERAs or EOBs, if it's coming across in our standard language of ANSI, we're going to see it as a claim, um, the claim adjustment reason code. And when we see those claim adjustment reason codes, it can tell us a lot of information. When we see a claim adjustment reason code coming through, it's so important that you prioritize, that you prioritize this information because the insurance company is giving you what I like to call breadcrumbs. Like they are saying, here, here is the information that you need to help you get to the destination, which is hopefully reimbursement for said services, right? Here are the reasons why, okay? You must, you must use that data to your advantage instead of doing what unfortunately a lot of folks do, which is we're just going to go straight to the AR report and we start calling and trying to find out all the different statuses of the claims and all the stuff instead of looking first at the processing of our first remit. What happened with our claim adjustment reason code first, okay? Um, and so give me one second. I see some chats here. So... Um, oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, cool. I don't see, um, I don't see what you're talking about there, Nicole. So, <laughs> okay. 
Um, oh, oh, I see. Oh, the Facebook. Oh, I see it down there at the bottom. I just see it blank. So, okay. <laughs> there was a comment that came in, but I can't see it. So <laughs> sorry. I, um, she said, she said that it was, um, is it Ahmed, Ahmed Khan who sent a, um, an avatar sticker? Yes. So <laughs> yeah, it was celebrating that. I can't, it, there's nothing that shows up on the screen for me. It just says Facebook user. So it's probably, um, like something, maybe a limitation with like what the system that we're using. So, okay. So, um, so now we understand, do we understand you guys let me know in the comments. If you're like, I don't, I still don't get it. We understand claim rejections and claim denials. Yes. I hope. Let me know. Let me know if you're still confused. We are, you know, we're going to continue drilling this. My goal is that you guys walk out of this and you're just like, yeah, get it. I totally understand it. All right. So now that we understand our claim rejections, and claim denials, we also talked about what's most important, right? Claim rejections come first in our revenue cycle. So again, claim not getting out the door is indicative of it being stopped. Something's not happening. So we've gotten stalled in the revenue cycle. So we must work claim rejections first, and then we think about our claim denials. Okay. Claim rejections have to be worked first because if the claim didn't make it to insurance company, there's no need to be following up on our claims through AR. Okay. So it's really important that we're tracking, we're looking into what's going on with the claim in our claim rejections. And then um, same thing after we know claim was accepted, then we're looking at what happened to the processing by, by researching what claim denial. Okay. So, so like, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing screen and um, hi, hi, comfort. Thank you so much for hanging out and welcome to the channel. So happy that you're here. Okay. I'm going to share screen real quick. And um, let me make sure I've got the right. What does that look like? The wrong screen. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, oh, it's because I opened up. There it is. Okay. <laughs> I put my notes on top of it. Give me a second, guys. Okay. There she is, Miss America. Okay, that's really. Why is that so small? Oh, I guess I need to make it bigger. So I can't have it in the middle of my screen the way that I had it. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to make it smaller. Okay. So this is open practice solutions. And if you're not familiar with it, um, it is a system that we like to use for clients that don't have their own um, practice management system, meaning uh, a system that we aren't working out of that is also um, houses the, the practices EHR or electronic health records. Um, the best part about open practice for us as a billing company is that it can be quite uh, EHR agnostic, which means that it, it likes to work with a lot of different EHRs and it can be able to ingest information and data from the other systems. Now, it of course depends upon whether that system will play nicely, meaning will they actually open themselves up to transmit to open practice, but it does make it possible. It also can be a fully end-to-end -end um, type solution, meaning we have the opportunity to schedule our patients and make sure that their balances are, are completely resolved. So we're, we're taking them through the whole revenue cycle. The only piece that it does not have is a comprehensive EHR. And so it's important to know that if you're, if you're someone who is a billing agency, it could be valuable to you. However, it's not necessarily going to fill all of the gaps for your clients if they need EHR. Now, they have a list of EHR preferred vendors that work um, very, very closely with open practice. One of the reasons why it could be beneficial to our um, practices, the, the providers to, to kind of have a separation of, we'll say, church and state, is sometimes you can get a very nice specialty specific EHR system that serves all of the needs for that specialty, but those systems have sometimes very weak, very weak practice management functionality and revenue cycle management tools. And we as billers care about those things. So OPM is fantastic. I'm going to call it OPM for short now. OPM is fantastic because they work with a lot of billing agencies, so they know what we need as billers. And so it's also possible with, with OPM to have all of your clients under your own billing um, uh, we'll call it umbrella. So you have a main account and then you have what are called child sites and the ability to see all of those uh, children underneath one umbrella and also giving permissions by role-based access um, when, when you have uh, individuals that are doing things like scheduling or um, payment posting and things like that. 
All right. So we're going to just be peeking into OPM today and talking. I'm going to continue teaching and talking through what this a better, a best practice and a strategy would be to work denials. Um, and let me just get my comments out here so I can see. Oh, hey, David's in the house. Hello. Welcome to the channel, too. I love that. I love that we got so many new. And we've got Miss Katrina, our member. Hello. You're struggling to find. Okay, yeah. So we so struggling to find out why claims are denying or struggling to find out why you hate claim denials. <laughs> Curious. Um, so let me know and I'll, I would love to help. And um, sometimes, you know, it, the challenge with being able to provide special uh, specific answers to questions on a platform like this is that there's so many variables to think about, like when we talk about specialties, we talk about um, state specific rules. There's also um, there's also sometimes so <laughs> it's funny because <laughs> you just said both. Um, so I'm going to talk. I'll talk to you about this. Uh, what what I believe could be the problem. Um, but so here here's the deal. It's like we, we end up with these different variables that have to be considered when we're trying to um, provide solutions. But there sometimes are um, some valuable logic that we universally would apply, meaning like steps that we would take to be able to try to source and find the answer. So that is what I hope to be able to do if I can't answer questions like specific questions, for example, with uh, Miss Katrina, Ms. Katrina's. Um, that's my middle name, by the way, <laughs> with Miss Katrina's um, uh, challenge with the um, with with denial. So I'm going to say this about uh, potentially I'm going to put your your uh, other comment back up here. So here's what I will tell you. And this is something that I talk a lot about um, that we have to always be thinking about what we're doing professionally through the lens of what our our passions are and then our areas of strength right so things that we are just naturally great at now we often have to we have to do things that we're just not as passionate about from time to time right but you have to always be recognizing that sometimes there are things that you are not passionate about and you're going to be needing to do those things so and i say this like so let me give you an example so as a business owner okay I'll give you an example of like sales, okay? So if I run a I run a medical billing company, but I know that I'm not very passionate about sales, but I'm just starting my business, okay? If I'm just starting my business, I have no choice. I have to if I want to actually have a business, I need to sell services. Now, what that means is like you've got to make yourself make sure that you are in kind of an optimal state, like you are in the best state possible when you're selling. So that means like if you're someone who's a morning person and you're like really energetic in the morning, that's when you're doing the selling. Right. Or in your case, Ms. Katrina, that might be when you're working your denials, like you're at the top of your game. You're going to do the thing that you do not like during that time because you're at least going to bring a better and like higher energy to it and you will probably have more success than if you're doing it when you're tired when you're um already kind of overworked where you've already worked a 40 hour work week and you're trying to squeeze it in at the very end of the week um or you know or even a 60 hour work week and you're trying to squeeze it into this little window of time right so you have to keep in mind that like your attitude and how you approach the, the work is going to impact whether you can be successful at it, especially if it's something that you are just not passionate about. And sometimes there are things that are not our passions and not our areas of strength. And that is indicative of stuff that we should try to avoid because it means that we will um, probably be spinning wheels at it. So I'm not saying that don't, you know, just quit your job and walk away or just don't do, don't do denials or don't work them. Um, but try first changing the relationship, change the timing in which you're doing it and see if that fixes it. And then maybe down the road, you're like, okay, my next move is going to be more towards the stuff that I love in the revenue cycle. Like my, my next career move might be something more targeted in the area that I really am passionate about. Okay. So I hope that helps. Let me know if that helps. All right. Um, uh, so I have a little bit of a secret to tell you guys that at this very moment, um, Nicole very recently, and I don't know where she shared it, but I know people have been booking. I opened my calendar for questions about about courses. If there are questions that you have about taking training and things like that with me, my calendar is open, but very, very lim limited amount of time and for some, some limited windows. So it is a 15 minute call. I don't want all questions. It's not like a, Hey, like ask me anything kind of situation. Again, our members can do that on our live Q and A's, but, um, when we're on our calls, it's just about courses. So if you've got questions about courses, you can go to that link. If it's about general questions, 
it in the comments and we will try to get to them. We have a lot of other questions that come in, as you guys can imagine. And so we prioritize those, those as they come in. When we're on live and you want to ask questions, ask them. And if I can fit them in and it's related to the discussion, I'm so happy to, to chat about them. All right. Um, so thank you. I love that. Thank you. I appreciate you too. That is so kind of you. So, okay, cool. Yay. I'm so happy that helps. Thank you so much, Ms. Katrina. Okay. Yeah. And keep your head up because trust me, we all do things in, in healthcare from time to time that we're just not so passionate about. And it's just, it's just sometimes just being aware of it and saying, you know what, I really just don't like this, but I'm going to have a, like a really good attitude around it because I know it's temporary. Right. And just kind of sit with that and, and recognize that, that you, you know, that you're moving on to something different but we're going to work on this for now. <laughs> All right. So, um, so here's the deal is I, um, when it comes to our systems, when we are working our rejections, the view and the display that you will see or could see might be very, very different than what we're looking at today. Um, so just keep that in mind, grain of salt. Okay. So I have on a dashboard here in my open practice software, I have a dashboard that tells me my claim status. This is on my home dashboard, but I also have an area called claims, which also presents something similar to me, okay? So if I'm looking at this area, I wanna first think about what I see in front of me. So they're green. Green means go. Also in most cases means good. And so they have their own classification about colors. It's like green is fine. We're not worried about green. Yellow, we're probably worried about, and it looks like, and this is a demo site, so keep that in mind. Um, this is probably stuff that I have held up on my own, see, based on this, like if, if this was my active system, I may have put something in here on hold, or I may have deemed something incomplete that I have chosen to hold back. So yellow, I, I care about, right? Red are things that are coming in that I absolutely am prioritizing. And in this system's case, it's putting in red my clearinghouse rejections and my pair rejections, okay? So keeping in mind that clearinghouse, based on what I said already, is coming from the system that is built into the software, okay? Payer rejections is coming from the payer's clearinghouse, the insurance carrier's clearinghouse. They are sending messages back to us there's old school names and language for this. If you have someone, if you have a system that is sending you back payer reports, meaning like a list of claims accepted and a list of claim reject claims rejected, you might have a different view altogether, but you're getting the same data. It's nice when you have a clearinghouse that actually serves you in this way, that gives you um, groups of them. And it also, in this situation with the software, it's telling me everything that is in current status that is claim rejected, um, excuse, um, that are, have claims rejected, it's giving them to me in a queue. So it's like, hey, these need to be worked. So I can see all of them on the dashboard without me needing to kind of go searching for reports. Way back in the day, like, oh my gosh, there was like old school systems like MD on and MD online and whatever, these older clearing houses that had, um, and some of them still work like this, that had payer reports that we used to have to look at and we would like have to highlight and save pages of the report to like work on and find out why claims rejected. Such a pain. Clearing house and they got organized. If you're still working on one that has reports, you might consider looking at different solutions because um, there's just no reason why you should be wasting your time with reports. That is literally at least a 10 to 15 year old process. That shouldn't be the case for you. All right. So, um, so if you have a system that is prioritizing them for you, you can immediately jump to the bucket. So I, you'll notice I've got three different areas here. So I've got primary, secondary, tertiary. Primary meaning this is the first Ins the first insurance that patient has a contract with, secondary meaning the second insurance, tertiary meaning the third insurance. So there's there's different um, steps in the process, right? So primary meaning first insurance hasn't accepted the claim, they kicked out the claim, okay, for this, whether or not it's um, for payer or clearinghouse rejections. Secondary means claim was going already, they already got processed potentially by the primary successfully, it was going to the second insurance, and then it kicked back, okay? And the same, same is true for tertiary. So when I am looking at my claim rejections, I am going to care, as I said, about both buckets. I care about clearinghouse and payer rejections. I might instead focus only on one first. So I may not go to a whole list that shows me both clearinghouse rejections and payer rejections, okay? 
Um, there is there is this uh, local edit error as well, and this means like you can block. Let me hide this. You can block claims. I don't. Again, this is a demo site, so I don't even know if it shows me. Yeah, you can block for certain things. So like, let's say. Um, I need to have this, and then this is a silly, you need tax ID for everything. But um, if you, let's say you have a very unique requirement for a particular insurance, you can set up a, a custom edit with a lot of clearing houses that will flag claims that don't have said data. So like, for example, if you are working, you're in a specialty, you're working with um, a, a carrier that requires you to put uh, a, a legacy provider number, right? This is like an old provider number, whether it's a Medicaid number or something, some other kind of um, uh, payer or provider number, according to the provider contract, they might want that in a weird place or a unique place on the claim, all right? Sometimes that happens. And when that happens, you can often set up a, in a custom edit to be set up with your clearinghouse, okay? So that is what this type of local area edit might be. So it's like, we're holding this back for you because you told us to. And to be printed are claims that they're like, hey, like you got to print these. Like either we're not printing them for you because clearing houses, a lot of the cases can print them for you. They do it on a per claim pricing basis. So sometimes might cost too much money for you if you have a lot going out. Um, but it also could make it smoother if you've got one or two hap happening and you want them to take care of it. In this case, it looks like I don't have the claim set up to go out by the clearing house um, by the, yeah, the, the software's clearing house. So I'm going to be the one to have to go to these claims and print them myself. Okay. So that explains my, my, my buckets here. So if I am curious to know what's going on with my claims, I can click into my buckets and, um, um, I've got the ability to filter out by all these different criteria, which is really nice. So if I know I'm working only on, let's say I have a long list, that was nine on my list there, but let's say I have like 50. All right. Um, if I had 50 claims, there's a chance I want to focus on a particular insurance. And yes, I could absolutely sort. I can click to sort by said insurance column. Or I could also go back to my filter and specifically highlight whatever criteria I want and isolate by that criteria, which is very, very nice because there are many of us who work in departments where we are required to only focus on one, one insurance. So maybe you are someone only um, responsible for United Healthcare in your practice. You can go right into this area and search specifically for United and pull out your people. Okay. Um, so give me a second. Let's see. We like a specific time midweek. Okay. Uh, Okay, so this I won't be, I wouldn't be able to do um, this for, so I have a uh, on that link actually, this might be on our links page, and Nicole, if you may want to grab it. If you're looking for one-on-one -on -one support from a problem-solving perspective, Camille, and this goes for anybody, um, I do charge for that, and there is a booking link that you can use specifically for that. If we get on a call for a 15-minute um, and it's not about like courses or training that we provide, um, then uh, I won't continue the call. So um, if you if you book with me though for a paid session and we are kind of workshopping stuff, I'm happy to, to support you through whatever you're struggling with. Um, so there's a link though, a separate link for that. And it's like a medical billing support or something like that is the name of the link, Nicole, in case you're looking for it. So um, let's see, a refresher course, you can take the exam. Okay, I love it. What exam are you taking, Comfort? What? Tell me what exam, is it CPB? What exam are we thinking about? So um, let's see. Okay, medical billing and coding refresh. So CPB or CPC or what? which I'm just curious or, or another certification from a different organization. Let me know. Okay, so here we go. Um, so I'm here in my rejections. I've organized by whatever I desire to see. Now, again, every insurance, um, every software is a little different, right? But I have some information here that helps me determine, and this is, you know, um, demo information. So it helps me determine though what potentially could be going on. So I'm going to give you an example of a scenario that could be coming uh, up with a particular situation. So in this, in this system, I've got a couple of different, uh, demo providers. Okay. I'm like, I don't know the demo providers names. So let's just say Arnold is not registered because he just joined the practice and we shouldn't even be having claims going out for Arnold because we know he's not in network yet. We're waiting for him to be credentialed. 
this could be the reason why claims are being rejected. So I could go back and search specifically for Arnold and I could hold that claim batch because I don't want them to go anywhere. And I could even potentially build an edit that says, hey, any claims that has Arnold Warren on them, please block these claims from going out because I don't want them to submit to insurance and then get denied. And then we've got to go through reopening claims. Big waste of time. Okay. So there's, there are us to, um, to hopefully prevent claims from going to insurance carriers when they're not supposed to by using technology to support you. Okay. Because yes, we have, a lot of us have closing reports that are a bit more manual, meaning we can pull a report that shows us end of day services and things like that, but we're all human. We miss things. We could miss, um, a message or a particular section on a report that has, um, this provider on it. Or maybe your system just doesn't communicate that on the actual report. Sometimes it doesn't give us all the great detail. Okay. So, um, so it's helpful to use the data on the report that you get, um, on the, excuse me, on the rejections that you get. And so if you're, if you see that this information is here, you're like, Oh, I see him. He got on there. I'm going to pull this claim out and I'm going to hold this claim myself, right? I'm going to change the status and actually hold that claim. So I could click and I could change the status and I could instead put the claim on hold and put my own internal note in there that tells me, um, why the claim is being put on hold. All right. So, um, so I am looking at my claim rejections now, um, claim rejection, sorry, claim rejections in this system have all of the data that is helpful to know what potentially is going on with the claim. Um, and it's telling me here, it was specifically with these were EEs, meaning rejected by the payers themselves. And I can see that the balances that are remaining or not like this one, like why is a claim rejected and there's no balance left, right? That could be indicative of like, this doesn't even matter. Like why are we even like, maybe this should not matter. It should not have gone out. Maybe this claim should not even be um, considered. And this could be the case because secondary claim, right? Maybe primary paid the entire claim and the system is trying to push it to secondary, but there's no balance. We don't need the claim to go. So we could consider this claim resolved. So this is helpful for us to have our clearinghouse built in because I get all the data. So if you're using an outside clearinghouse, you probably don't have the, the ability to see balances such as patient balances and insurance balances that are remaining on the specific um, encounter in question. Um, you'll also notice here that I can link directly to the patient um, account and I can link back to the encounter itself. Okay. Which means patient account is like all of the visits for that one patient, whether paid or unpaid encounter is the visit specifically related to this data service. That's the encounter. Okay. That's the, that is the visit, the date of service that we're looking at. Okay. Um, and so I am noticing for some reason, I don't have my, my details showing up on this view. Um, anyway, I'll, let's see. Hmm. I was in here earlier and I thought, or maybe I went to a different batch. Let's go back to claims and yeah. Clearing house rejection. That's probably what it is. I think I was under clearing. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So this is clearing house rejection. So clearing house rejection. So claim the payer rejection um, one didn't have any reasons. That's not the case. Typically they have them down here. This is a demo site. So they just didn't bake any in for the demo site. Um, so it's showing up as payer rejected, but there's no reasons basically, but this is an example of what it would actually look like. It's it, the information that comes back from payers are sometimes um, confusing um, and look a little bit like what we see here. So reason codes, um, not the same thing as what I see here. You're not getting a standard reason code, um, such as this claim rejection um, code, the claim adjustment reason codes that we talked about earlier. What I'm getting is a, is the insurance carrier's way of communicating the rejection back to us. So this one's saying this, the member ID must be this, this, and this. Now keep in mind, this is kicking back to me at the clearinghouse level. So this is coming back from my clearinghouse and it also could be coming back to um, to us from the insurance carriers clearinghouse, but these types of things right here, like diagnosis codes, payer ID, right? These are all soup. These are all very, um, superficial rejections, meaning they aren't coming because there's, uh, the payer is saying the claim, uh, wasn't processed because of benefits or anything like that. They're, they're coming because the, the, the clearinghouse has determined that you don't have the right diagnosis 
set up for that's actually billable. And then uh, the payer ID, which is the kind of the, we'll call it the address that uh, the ins- that belongs to the insurance for claims transmitted electronically. Okay. So payer IDs are required. It's, it's, it's almost like if I was mailing a claim and I needed the, the mailing address, it's the same concept. I'm sending the claim electronically. I need the payer ID to get that claim there properly electronically. Okay. So when we have these situations where the insurance carrier, excuse me, the clearinghouse is coming back with data to tell us that, um, they are to, uh, to tell us that the diagnosis itself is not correct. We need to do a couple of things. We need to understand the source of the, the, the actual rejection. So if I see a lot of denials, I'm sorry, not denials, rejections related to this particular um, reason, the diagnosis being the, the, a code that is no longer valid. For example, this is an ICD-9 code. <laughs> it's definitely not valid. Um, the, di- the diagnosis code is no longer valid. I am absolutely going to jump to try to fix the source. Okay. I'm trying to resolve the source of the problem because there's a chance that my database is allowing people to select a diagnosis that shouldn't be selected. So if I can't fix it, no big deal. I'm going to let my supervisors or the software, the, the software support team, whomever, whoever I have con- contact with to try to prevent this because these are preventable. These are preventable. And so it's important to, to, to stop it from happening at the source at, and not wait for it to continue to come up because it will. If the providers don't know that that procedure code can't be, uh, excuse me, that diagnosis code can't be selected, then um, you, you want to educate them but you also want to stop them from being able to even select it. Okay. So education is also a potential thing, whether or not it's a diagnosis um, code situation or a payer ID, who is the person setting up the insurance companies? And do they know that payer IDs are required? Perhaps you can educate that individual and say, Hey, please don't add insurances in here until you have verified and confirmed that payer ID that needs to be submitted, uh, selected for that particular insurance carrier. And how do they go about that? Make sure they know how to do that and properly do that before they set up this patient with this with a new insurance company. Okay. So you're really going to work to identify the problem. So you're classifying it. You're kind of saying, okay, how many of these things are, are stuff that I could potentially prevent? How many of these are things I need to just work on on a case by case? So classifying that problem. And then you're really trying to clarify and, and, more more clearly identify the source of it and hopefully going to the source and resolving things at the source okay so really thinking about what that means like what would it mean for me to make sure that um that the payer id is always put in there how could i go about that maybe it's something i could do and change in my workflow all right And so be thinking about globally how to impact these rejections, especially when it's possible. Now, there are situations that might be very unique. For example, um, if it's a new insurance company and you've got um, somebody has or a new new patient, excuse me, and somebody miskeyed a patient's ID, it's a one-off situation. Yes, you could go educate the front desk and say, hey, please make sure you run eligibility on the information that's in the software. But it might be an isolated thing. Maybe they just were having a bad day and they missed a few digits when they put the information in. You're going to go out and you're going to get this corrected. Okay. So this, this might be a situation where you're kind of one off correcting it. Um, so this right here is saying you need to have primary payment information in order for a secondary insurance carrier to process the claim. Meaning if I'm trying to send this claim to a secondary carrier, they are not going to process it unless I have already pro- gotten the claim processed by the primary insurance. I need to be sending electronically. I need to be sending the data that confirms what happened with the primary insurance company's processing of the claim. Okay. That's what that type of rejection means. That is very specific to this scenario. That is not something that I could necessarily kind of globally, um, apply a a strategy to or a resolution plan to what I could do is make sure my software is set up correctly to automatically produce this and ensure that the information is present, but it may not, um, 
be something that is a, a gap for the software. It might be just a, one particular patient's account didn't get updated with the primary processing correctly. Okay. So I hope that makes sense, uh, the types of rejections that we're talking about there and how you might kind of workshop some of those. So I've got my claim management um, tab that tells me, again, claim rejections. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more in detail about denial. I'm going to peek in uh, real quick just to the denial management just so you can see um, that, that area of the software. So in this software, when an insurance company processes the claims, and there is a denial that is captured, meaning it sees that a denial came through on a remittance, then the denial itself gets pulled into a denial work list. And it also shows up on the patient's account that there's a denial that is um, pending or outstanding on this patient, all right? And so, um, so we have a list as well for our denials. And so on here, and I'm not gonna go too, too um, far down the path in explaining this, but same kind of concept of what we were talking about where there might be some things that we have put on hold. There's the denial work list, that's a general work list of all the denials, which is what I'm looking at here. And then there might also be a custom work list where I said, you know what, I need to pull this, all of these patients with said scenario into a list because for example, let's use Dr. Arnold that we talked about earlier. So for example, if I have a, a provider that I'm holding claims for and half of those claims got out to insurance and denials came back, I'm going to need to go back and request reprocessing, especially if his contract was active retro, meaning they, they backdated the start date for his contract. I need to have an easy work list of those of those claims that I could perhaps send to my provider rep and say, hey, like, can you pre -re please reprocess all these claims? Or that I could include with a letter and ask the insurance carrier to please reprocess all of these claims with these ICN numbers, these internal claim numbers. Okay, so that is where I where I could potentially use my own custom work list, and um, and and in addition to my denial uh, list that is being compiled for me. So in this system, it is it is pulling all denials into one area. So I'm not going to go super far down the path of like ex, um, explaining the denials because um, that's going to take us a little bit too um, too far down down the road. We're going to apply a very similar logic to what I just broke down with rejections. Okay. So when you are looking at your claim rejections, you're looking at Again, you're trying to classify the types of rejections and you're trying to really kind of identify what what happened, identify the, what what the, the cause or the status of, of said issue, and you're going to try to fix the claim or the situation at the source. You can do the same thing with your denials. However, you're probably, you may not be able to fix if there's not a, a clear um, fix for something at the source, but you're going to try to fix them in bulk wherever possible. Okay. So like if an example of what I just said with Dr. Arnold's claims, if I knew the claims all got processed before his contract was active, I am reopening those claims and I'm asking them to reprocess them because his contract was made retroactive. Okay. That's something that would be um, me trying to fix things in a more project approach instead of trying to get <clears throat> one claim at a time. In healthcare, the slowest way to work in the revenue cycle is one claim at a time. And I will, we'll talk about this heavily during AR discussions because the volume can be so high. We could have hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of claims. And if you get in and you're like, I'm just going to go to the first one on my list and you start working down the first one on your list, you could be seeing the first one, the third one, the 10th one, the 11th one, the 15th one. And like every few claims, exactly the same type of scenario, exactly the same issue. And when you have that kind of one off approach where you're just working one thing at a time, you're just you're constantly shifting in and out of the same things and just wasting massive amounts of time. And you could get through so much more. Like from, from my perspective, people who struggle with hitting their targets when it comes to output and whatever the expectation is for you to work denials or um, claim rejections and, and AR, it's usually because they do not have a proper strategy. It's because they haven't thought about ways that they can group information together. All right. To say, okay, I'm working on Medicare. Let me look at for denials. Let me look at Medicare claims with the same procedure code. 
and let me work on exactly that same type of potentially the type of denial. Or maybe I'm looking at Medicare and the same claim adjustment reason code specifically. Okay. Like really trying to apply. I love to do things like that with, for example, Medicare CO109. That is a claim that is going to the wrong carrier. Such an easy fix in most cases. It's like patient gave us Medicare and other cards and someone put the other cards, I mean, the, the Medicare in there instead of the other cards. in. so for example, someone has Humana instead of uh, Humana Medicare, instead of Medicare, they have a, um, a, and Medicare Advantage plan is what it's really the, the, the proper name for it. I like to call them Medicare replacement plans because they're supposed to replace Medicare. And so when Medicare is entered in, they're going to send us that CO 109. They're saying, Hey, the claim went to the wrong place. We actually aren't supposed to be the ones processing this claim such an easy fix, such an easy fix. So if I see on my denial list, I've got Medicare claims with CO 109 and I've got, you know, out of a thousand, um, denials, they get, they get big, 200 of them are the exact same thing. And there's only eight patients that have 200 claims. I don't know. That's a lot, but <laughs> who knows, right? You could literally fix like that many claims within a matter of clicks. Maybe you already have the insurance cards on file. All you're doing is correcting it to put the proper primary insurance in place and you're getting the claim back out to insurance. Okay. So there are so many ways that you can um, improve your process by just at your improve your output by just creating an effective strategy from the, from day one, from jump is what I was going to say, but not really from the, from the moment you start. All right. Um, so here we go. I am going to, uh, screen sharing for a moment and look at other questions up here. So, uh, here we go. Uh, this is a really interesting question. This is, um, okay. I can't say for sure, but this is super common for United healthcare to pay, um, what's per diem rate, which means that according to a visit, they say, according to this particular specialties contract, we will only play pay X per day per diem for this said service. Okay. And again, it's going to depend. I don't know what specialties you're billing for, but there are a lot of unique scenarios with, um, insurances like United healthcare, where they have a contract that says, we don't care what you bill, we will pay $70 per diem. Okay. So yes, I would absolutely suggest that you check into the specialty and sometimes stuff like that is public because it is again, not, it's not a contract basis with that. It could not, may not be a contract, um, basis with that specific provider or practice. It could be a medical policy for that specialty. So they might say we will only pay $70 for physical therapy or for, um, orthopedic, I don't know. I'm just the random, random stuff. She's out there, right? They might say that, that that's not, those are not good examples. They're not actual examples. So I'm saying those are just me just throwing out, just saying like the policies are going to be specific according to the insurance, um, but according to the providers or practices specialty, and it could impact the whole thing. So you could literally consult the Google gods is what I call it. Like you just go out there and just check to see if there is, because you might save yourself a lot of heartache trying to uncover, um, the provider's contracts when, you know, people don't keep track of their contracts and it, it drives me bonkers. I, I don't understand it, but, um, they don't keep track of their contracts. So if you can't get your hands on it, you potentially could get answers by, you know, searching on Google or getting a rep on the phone and trying to ask them the medical policy number. A lot of them have numbers associated with policies that are global policies, meaning they impact all provider types or their, um, specific, they might have a policy they could refer you to. I love to get a copy of that policy and save it in your record somewhere so that you can keep that on file as education and reminders and potentially source from to create rules for your practice or medical billing department. You have to say, Hey, everybody, when you find this out, if it's, if it's true, United Healthcare only pays $70 for this. So your payment posting team needs to know it. Your AR team needs to know it. Your practice administrators, everyone needs to know it. Okay. They all need to be educated because you're, everyone could be wasting time and spinning wheels with 
following up on claims and trying to find out researching and trying to find out why, 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 especially when you get new people in, if you can have this information disseminated to everyone on your team and you guys can create rules and establish rules by way of you not touching a claim when they paid the, what they were expected to be, what if they paid, what was expected of them. And you got to keep in mind when these numbers come up, seven, if it's $70 is like the per diem rate that does, that does not I'm sorry, that does mm, the co-insurance and copay does get factored in to that amount. So if the patient has a $35 copay, they're paying $35. Okay. So important to know that. So you're not getting $70 because they want to pay you 70. Okay. I hope that answers the question. So, um, so, oh, I'm sorry. Did I totally just go off on like a whole tangent, Camille, and you weren't even talking to me, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> you can talk to me if you want to talk to me. So, <laughs> but thanks. You, you got me sharing something that maybe helps other people. So it's <laughs> funny. Um, so Asif, hello, no worries. I get it. Work is happening. Life is happening. Thank you for hanging out. Though. Thanks for making it. Um, eager to resolve. Yay. I love it. So I am excited that you're eager and I want to know what questions are coming up for you as you're navigating the path. I, I really want to uh, to hear from you, Miss Katrina, as you re reestablish your relationship and hopefully heal <laughs> the relationship with, with denials. Um, I want to know if this helped and what, what maybe needs to kind of help into. Oh, okay. OT for sure. Um, that was a $70 question. Yes. You're probably dealing with a per diem rate. So yes. Um, I would absolutely look that up and it's probably going to be an optum, um, what you're looking for. So I would, I would search. I'm, I'm pretty certain that, um, that optum has almost every state has a per diem for PT and OT, which is why I threw that out. Um, every state has slightly different. Like I know that, um, it's like some states have a lot less in certain states and, and other states have a little bit more like 70, I think might be the highest per diem. I've seen like 40, I've seen 60. So, um, so yeah, you might be, um, able to find that pretty easily online and just keep that information handy because you just don't want to be wasting time. So yay. Cool. Um, all right, my friend. So, uh, medical billing, mini coaching. Yes. That's the medical billing mini coaching link. Nicole's out and Nicole's verifying. So yeah, if you guys need help, um, support with problem solving, um, and you want my one-on-one -on -one support, I can help you on a one-on-one -on -one basis with scenarios. There are limited slots for what's called the medical billing, um, mini coaching session. And it, there are opportunities for us to work together. Even with PHI, we just would need to sign a BA beforehand. So if you are wanting to kind of have me do a screen share and help you with something, um, again, I don't know all specialties and I don't pretend to know everything, <laughs> but I will be happy to give you my logic. I've been exposed to a lot of stuff. Then I say stuff, meaning a lot of specialties, a lot of scenarios, a lot of situations, 20, a lot of years, 26 years of 20, a lot of years. <laughs> like I say that and I'm like, I don't even know a lot of years. Um, yeah. 26 years of experience or something like that. So the, um, the approach is what I would teach you if I don't know your specialty at all at your state or your region. So, um, so it's important to, uh, to, to know that, you know, I'm happy to help you, to help you kind of, uh, create your own strategy with a situation. Um, I am not, um, the, the answer to all things, but I will be happy, happy to connect you with people that might have the answer. If you're needing something very specific in the way of training in your specialty, if I, if I have the resource or know the resource, um, for it. So love it. Cool. Um, let's see. Oh, that's sweet. I'm sure you would be very helpful to many. Thank you. That's so sweet, Tyra. I appreciate you. Nevertheless, your wealth of knowledge. Oh, thank you. Content and quality. That's so sweet. You guys are so kind. You're making me blush. I love you. Thank you for that sweetness. Um, so uh, listen, we have so many things going on in the channel. Um, just to kind of recap, if you are um, not sure or um, not clear, maybe you're just joining you might have missed that we have the memberships on. We have our member live this past Tuesday. Members members had a live stream that was a Q&A. Um, there's a monthly Q&A available for members. And our 
members Q and A's. The cool thing about them when you are a member is you get access to all the old ones. So you have like your own member area on YouTube. So I should mention that actually, if you're watching from other platforms, YouTube has its own member area. And so you get like your own member only updates and member only, um, discount codes for courses. If you're trying to take courses, um, there's a lot of, a lot of really cool perks. You also get badges. If you haven't seen the badges and you're, if you're on YouTube, you might see the badges for members popping up. It doesn't show up when I screen share, but like Miss Katrina, as an example, um, she's got her, a, a little member badge off to the right. So if you pop on YouTube and rewatch this, you'll see what I'm talking about. So you keep these cute little member badges that Nicole and I are just so excited about. We love our little member badges. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, let me know what other thoughts, questions you have. We're going to spend a little bit more time. So 26 years. Yeah. Thanks. It's a lot. It's a lot of, it's been a lot of time. <laughs> you know, you learn, you learn, um, that, you know, the, the adage of the old adage of there's nothing new under the sun is very true. Even though there's a lot of stuff constantly changing in healthcare, the approach is fairly the same. There are some very unique scenarios in certain specialties, but the general approach to once you've got it and you've got a solid understanding of it, it's going to be, it's going to be kind of rinse and repeat for the most part and, um, optimizing it or improving it is pretty much, um, the same. So I love it. Thank you so much for that. You guys are amazing. You guys are amazing. I appreciate each and every one of you so much. And I'm going to let you guys get back to your day because we're 15. So I appreciate you all. We will see you guys real soon. We're going to thank the members. They have their names scrolling on the bottom of the page there. Thank you all so much for your support. It really helps us do the great things that we get to do here. And Nicole and I are so grateful to each and every one of you for just allowing us to, to serve you. And we look forward to just continuing to expand this relationship during the year. We have Mastering Medical Billing coming out. Um, another se session of that starting in, in March, if you're someone who needs medical billing training. Um, and my folks who are in the inner circle, they're locked in with me for a whole year. But if you're someone who's interested, stay tuned. Inner Circle opens back up in um, in September. So, um, so yeah, until then, my friends, I will see you all in the next video. Take care.